So if you look at the, the subject for the second talk, who am I, the apparent self or the real self? Well, the answer is, uh, at first, it might appear to be what is called in logic a tautology. It's, it's a trivial answer. Of course, I'm the real self. Why should I be the apparent self? But it's actually a very deep question. In Advaita Vedanta, the teaching that you are the absolute reality, you are Brahman, uh, it, the investigation begins with ourself. See, the note, notice that the teaching is that thou art, you are Brahman, um, or I am Brahman. It means I am not what I thought I was, the body and the mind. Uh, I am Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss. Brahman is not a god or some kind of uh, divine being. Brahman is nothing other than I myself. So, you know, it's actually pretty radical the way it is said that um, I am Brahman. It means I am not body, not mind. Like the Nirvana Shatakam says, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. I am of the nature of bliss. I am of the nature of consciousness. I am Shiva. That's what we normally understand it, and that's correct. But the other way around is also true. Shiva is nothing other than I. Shiva is nothing other than you. There is no, no other divinity, reality, other than the real you. That's a pretty radical statement. It works both ways. I am Brahman and nothing else. Brahman is I and nothing else. So the investigation starts with ourself. The way I put Advaita Vedanta forward in the um, uh, first talk that it is about an existing reality right here, right now, and nothing other than ourself. That it takes only our, our always available experiences, the experiences which are already available all the time. And Advaita Vedanta at its essence is basically a set of pointers towards our real nature. Um, that it can be attained effortlessly, it can be attained instantaneously. So now one might be thinking, that's a lot of tall talk. It's time to walk the talk. You see, the problem with that, the problem with the Advaitic teaching is this. If you're teaching a, a bhakti approach, um, the teacher might as well take refuge in God and say, look, be devoted to God, surrender to God, have faith in God. And then, and your realization, overcoming suffering, attainment of liberation, salvation, whatever, that depends on God, on God's grace. Don't ask me. The yoga teacher can say, look, here are the teachings and here is what you would expect to experience if you practice. So don't ask me. It depends on your practice. The more you practice, and it's true, the more we practice, we do get more and more proof, that proof that we are on the right path. But it's a long process and it's dependent on your practice. Depends on God or depends on you, not me, the teacher. But in Advaita Vedanta, there is no such escape route. Uh, you, you cannot say it depends on God because God is supposed to be nothing other than you. You cannot even say it depends on practice, but you just said that um, it's not dependent on practice. You are already Brahman and that it can be pointed out and realized right now. So you would say, uh, Swami, it is time to walk the talk. What is the phrase? Put your mouth, uh, put your money where your mouth is. Money where your mouth is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. So what we're going to do now is investigate ourselves to discover this infinite reality, which is, which is claimed that we are not this limited body and mind. We are this infinite, immortal existence, consciousness, place, and that we can discover it here and now. Looking into our ordinary experience. So this is the first step in Advaita Vedanta, an investigation into ourselves. How do we proceed? By looking at our experience. And you take it in three steps. One, listen to the instruction. Um, two, you try to understand what has been said. And three, we check, is this real? So three steps. What did the teacher of the text say? Step one, do I get it? I mean, you could always, in, for example, in classes, we, I mean, in education, college we hear a lot of things a lot of things we don't understand so the second stage is i've heard it i can even say it back to you but i don't understand it so that understanding is the second step 
And the third step is um, that, is it real for me? These three roughly correspond to the three steps of Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. These are Sanskrit terms for, um, Shravana literally means hearing, but it means systematically studying the Vedanta. And Manana means uh, thinking about it, reasoning about it, till we get clarity on what has been studied. And Nididhyasana means meditation, a kind of meditation where after you have studied it and you have understood it, you stay with what has been understood in order to make it a living reality. Um, the first stage comes to an end when you can confidently say, I know the study material. I, maybe I cannot repeat the exact Sanskrit verses, but I can tell you the gist of it. Then you've completed Shravana. What's the problem? I know it, but I don't understand it. So starts the second stage, reasoning it out. What is it that I don't understand? Ask questions, ask yourself, think it through. Or oh, many of the books have these Q and A's. They, they, um, they're called Purva Paksha. That means the opponent who questions con constantly uh, the claims of Advaita Vedanta. And the second stage has come to an end when we can confidently say, I have heard what you say, I know what you said, and I understand it too. I'm convinced, I'm sold, it's clear. Then what's the problem? I understand it, but we may have a doubt. I understand it intellectually. I'm still the same person. My life is still the same. The promise that you will overcome suffering, that you will attain lasting peace, that promise has not yet come true. So at that stage, what has been heard and understood must be assimilated, must become a living reality for me. And for that, one needs to stay with what you have understood and you're convinced about it. It's true. You stay with it. Staying with it means not only meditating upon it, just concentrating on it, but also living according to it. If you believe something to be true, why wouldn't you live accordingly? You would love, but you should live accordingly. So this struggle to live according to your conviction, that itself will sort out a lot of the problems in the mind. Uh, it, will, it will bring, it will make the teaching living and real. All right. I suppose it's time to start the investigation. So I'll, uh, uh, there are many, many procedures in Advaita Vedanta to discover, to point out our real nature, the real self. So this whole talk about apparent self and real self, uh, it reminds me of um, a philosopher, Bradley, who was a British philosopher, uh, idealist at the turn of the 20th century, um, 19th to 20th century. So he said, he wrote a book called Appearance and Reality. So in that book he says, what appears is not real and the real never appears. So that's very nicely put. What appears is not real and the real never appears. It's a play on the word appearance. So appearance in English has two meanings. Appearance is what you experience, that's an appearance. But appearance also means deceit or falsity. That person appears to be a nice person, which means that person is not a nice person. This uh, food appears to be tasty, but when you eat it, it's not tasty. So appearance means it's not real. So Advaita Vedanta uses in both senses. So we have to, but we have to start with the appearance because the so-called reality is not clear to us yet. Let's start with the appearance. I will take us through three procedures and then we will do a short meditation. Three procedures. Um, hear what, what was said, understand, and then dwell on it to make it real. First procedure is called the seer and the seen, drig drishya. The seer and the seen. What is the procedure? The procedure is look at your experience. All our experience, or whatever we experience from all the time, is has this structure of subject and object. I am experiencing. There's something that I'm experiencing. By experiencing, I mean seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, feeling. All this is experience, and I am the experiencer. So start with a very simple uh, operating principle. The operating principle is the experiencer and the experience. The seer and the seen are two separate things. They're different. They are not the physical entity. So for example, I am seeing, in a very naive uh, common sense approach, I am seeing all of you. So this computer screen which I'm seeing is the experienced, is the seen. And my eyes, let us say, are the seer. The eyes are seeing and the objects are seen. Notice immediately 
that the objects are different from the eyes. The eyes are different and the object is different. Second thing, notice that the, uh, the objects are many. I'm seeing so many of you. And when I look at outside, I can see um, the fall happening, the leaves fluttering down, golden leaves in the golden sunlight. I can see trees and the sky and the clouds. So many things are seen by the same organ of vision. Seer one, the seen are many. That's the second thing. Third, the seeing are continuously changing. You just saw Swami Atma Rupanandaji. Now you're seeing me. And if you look, out, look around, you will see different things are happening. So what is seen is continuously changing. And relative to that, the eyes are relatively unchanging. What I mean to say, the claim is that the seer is relatively unchanging and the seen are changing. The seer is one, the seen are many, and the seer and the seen are different. Three points. Let's go deeper. At each point, check. Did I hear what was said? Did I get it? And is it real? Is it real that my eyes are different from the screen? Of course, it's obvious. But hold on to that. Second, let's go deeper. Consider the eyes themselves, these, these organs of vision, the physical organs of vision. They're open, they're closed. I can see well, I can't see well, I need glasses. All of these things about the eyes are known by the mind. The eyes themselves become the seen. Seen not in the sense that the, uh, the mind actually sees something visually, it knows. Seen in the sense of, you know, when we say I see, it could mean you're actually seeing something or you understand something. The mind understands, knows the eyes, uh, the conditions of the eyes. The mind is the seer, the eyes themselves become the seen now because you're aware of, of the eyes uh, with your mind, not just the eyes, the ears and the nose and the skin and the tongue, all the organs of vision, all the organs of perception, the five organs of perception are known, seen by the mind. The mind is the seer and everything else is seen. The whole body is in fact seen. What about the world outside? It still remains as the scene. And the eyes themselves, which were regarded as the seer earlier, now they become the scene. And the whole body is the scene or the known. Again, the mind is different from what it sees, what it knows. Clearly the mind, whatever it is, cannot be the eyes. It's they're different, clearly, obviously they're different. And the seen are many, and the mind is one. The same mind, it sees, it hears, it smells, it tastes, it touches. All of these data is poured into the same mind. All kinds of perceptions, they are all collated and they become the mind as it were. So the mind is one and the seen are many. And the mind relatively is unchanging and the seen are continuously changing. At this point, somebody might say, hey, wait a minute. The mind is changing a lot. True, but the mind is changing into more mind, thoughts into thoughts. But the scene are changing in so many different ways. The eyes which could see well, now they don't see well, they need glasses, the ear needs a hearing aid, and so on. And so all the things keep changing outside in diverse ways. Again, the three points. The seer and the scene are different. The seer is one, the scene are many. The seer is rel relatively unchanging. The scene are changing. Okay, what have we got here? Remember, what did he say? Do I get it? Is it real? So far, it should all three should be straight away. Yes, yes, yes. Check all the boxes. Go on with it. All right. Now the third step, it becomes um, subtle and the magic begins to happen now, the third step. The mind itself. By the mind, I'm using a generic term. Just like the Swami said, it includes everything. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, desires, even the ego, sense of ego, I. All of these are the mind. Everything that's going on, private, first person in that, inside us, that's the mind. The mind itself is experienced. When a feeling of sadness comes, do I not experience it? Of course, that's why I say I'm sad. When a feeling of joy comes, I say I'm happy. It's because I'm experiencing it. Pain, when a pain comes, sharp pain, it, the mind recognizes it as pain. That's why I say it hurts. Notice how ridiculous it would be to say, how absurd to say that. There's a lot of pain, but I don't feel it. No, there's no pain if you don't feel it. The pain is entirely subjective. There may be a physical correlate of it, but the feeling you have to have to have, have pain. So feeling, experience in the mind, mind is experienced. All the mind is that which is directly experienced. 
If the mind is experienced, then the experiencer of the mind must be separate from the mind because experiencer and experience, seer and seeing are different. I, the experiencer of the mind, I must be different from the mind. First, big, big point. Second, note that I am the one which experiences the various states of the mind. Happy, sad, from this morning onwards, how many times joyful, how many times bored, how many times energetic, how many times uh, tired, uh, how many times curious, and so on. So many states of the mind. I am the one who was bored, I'm the one who is curious, I'm the one who was energetic, I'm the one who is tired. I am unchanging, and the mind is continuously changing. Third, the mind has many, many states. As I, I, I said, the mind has many states. I'm the one who experiences all these states. The mind keeps, keeps on changing a lot, fast, and I'm the one who experiences all these changes without changing. The seer is one, the seen are many. And the, I, the witness of the mind, I'm one. The mind is uh, manifold. Uh, I, the witness of the mind, am unchanging. The mind is continuously changing and I am different from the mind. So these are the three points again. This different entity, which is, which is not the mind, uh, this, is, this is called the witness consciousness, the real self. And the one more thing to note about it is, this one is never experienced. The immediate, uh, the immediate instinct we have is, really? Um, I never thought of that. Let me try to find this out. Don't. You'll never find it. You will never ever find it. Because what do we call finding something? What do we call knowing something? Experiencing something? What we call finding, knowing, experiencing is nothing other than objectifying. When you say I know something, it means I see it or hear it or smell it or taste it or touch it. Or it could mean I think about it or I understand it. I grasp it in some way. But the real self, logically think about it, the real self cannot be grasped in that way. So then it wouldn't be the self. After all, who is grasping? Because the seer and the seen are different. Subject and object are different. If I were to grasp, know, objectify my real self, then it would become different from me. It would no longer be the self. It would be the not self. Do you see the, the logic why it cannot be objectified? If you objectify it, it's not you anymore. It's an object. Because you are ever the subject. Is it unknown? No, it is known. Swami, you are contradicting yourself. No, it is known. But Swami Vivekananda said it is more than known. In one of the lectures in, in Jnana Yoga, he says, you must not go away with the idea that it is unknown and unknowable. It is more than known. You must know yourself before you know anything else. The Upanishad says in beautiful poetic language, the, that shining, everything else shines. By its light, everything is lit up. Tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. Uh, you shining, let's put it this way, you shining, everything else shines. By your light, everything is lit up. Not poetry. The claim is, it's a fact right now. And this real you, which is not an object, which cannot be objectively known, you, the subject, you know it only by being it. This real you is immortal because it doesn't change. There is a reason why it is immortal. We can go through that later. It is ever aware because everything appears to it. The physical world and the mind. It is the only knower. Directly it shines on the mind and it knows the mind. Through the mind shines on the sense organs and knows the sense organs. Through the mind and sense organs, it knows the external world. It is the only knower. It is in consciousness. It is immortal. This immortal consciousness that which is the light behind all knowledge, this is the real self. Procedure number one. The other two I'll go through very quickly. Then we will do an, a meditation exercise uh, to, to settle down on this. So what we're doing right now is hearing and thinking about it. The third part of it, meditating about it, we'll do a small exercise afterwards. Second procedure. To know what? To know my real self. This is called... Chit Jara. 
chit jara conscious not conscious chit means consciousness jara means not conscious the procedure is very simple if you are aware of it it's an object of your awareness it is not consciousness the one who is aware is consciousness so start this way so it it looks like the first one but it's different the first one is subject object seer and seen here the the what you are looking for is conscious not conscious how do you do that so i look at the pen am i conscious of it or is the pen conscious of it conscious of me i would say i am conscious of the pen i have no evidence that the pen is conscious of me so the pen is not conscious i am consciousness that seems pretty obvious what about the hand the body i am conscious of the body the body is not conscious of me look at the hand i feel i am experiencing the hand do i feel that the hand is experiencing me and the, hello we haven't met for a talk for a long time the hand is saying look good glad to meet again no that's ridiculous we don't feel that we feel it's a thing i am experiencing it i'm sure you'll have questions about this but but the answers are pretty simple actually uh, the hand is an object of my awareness uh, it 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 is not aware i am aware it is not aware fine now something dramatic come to the mind isn't the mind aware or are we aware of the mind a very simple experiment will prove it directly that the mind is also not aware we are aware of it and by our light the light of awareness the mind shines and illumines other things but the mind in itself is not aware think of a simple thought just a b c d or just workshop or um, you know 2 plus 2 is 4 so 2 plus 2 is 4 a simple thought just think a simple thought 2 plus 2 is 4 now ask yourself am i aware of 2 plus 2 4 or is 2 plus 2 4 aware of me is 2 plus 2 4 says hey there is sarva priyananda no 2 plus 2 4 is just a simple thought it's just almost insubstantial just a word and a concept shining in me the awareness encapsulated encapsulated by a bhrithi in the mind and revealed by me the consciousness no thought is aware you are awareness you shine and illumine all thoughts thoughts seem to glow with awareness is because they are glowing in your presence they have no light of their own they are as unaware as this thing thoughts are jada insentient so i am the consciousness which lights up thoughts body and external world external world body and thoughts are not consciousness i the self must be consciousness because i always feel i am the one who is consciousness so this i am consciousness and consciousness is i not the mind not the body not the external world second procedure chit jara conscious not conscious so do i hear it do i understand it and can i stay with it third one is very simple there are so many options you know <laughs> let me give you a cute one it is from uh, the aparokshana bhuti small one uh, it is ekam anekam we always feel that we are one you never feel like a committee no you feel you are one i am one person one being and that which is many cannot be me because the many cannot be one look at the body is it one or many it's many millions of cells billions of cells thousands of tissues dozens of organs and systems biological systems not one certainly not one it's a conglomerate a very busy changing buzzing conglomerate the body i am one the body cannot meet me because i am one and it is many the mind what we normally associate so closely with the mind is the mind one or many it is many thoughts feelings ideas memories even varieties of personalities there someone somebody might say that what about multiple personality disorder so doesn't the, isn't the person many and no even in multiple personality disorder they are one person at a time nobody ever experiences oneself as a committee you might feel you are a part of a committee and there are other members in the committee but in the committee you always feel you are one of them not all of them 
So the mind is also a conglomerate, again, a busy conglomerate. Uh, even the latest cognitive science theories are talking about the modular mind. There are modules, sub routines, subroutines running in the mind. So it's, it's, a, it's a compound. I am one, the mind is many. I, the one, cannot be the many, so I am not the mind. Ekam anekam. This is one more procedure to show that I cannot be the body, I cannot be the mind. So here we have the real self is one. It cannot be body mind, which are many. The real self is consciousness. It cannot be body mind, which are not conscious. Yeah. The real self is the witness, the seer, the body and mind are seeing. They cannot be the same thing. So this witness consciousness, which is one, and this is us, the real self. The claim is you should be able to appreciate it right now and staying with it, it should become our real identity. All right. How am I doing for time? Um, so uh, I have got, no, I'm almost out of time. Maybe I can take one question before doing the, a uh, couple of questions before doing the meditation session. Yeah, there's some people raising the hand. You can't raise your <laughs> hand physically. You have to raise your hand on the computer. I, actually, uh, instead of me, uh, me asking a question, since uh, you're only going to take one question and then we'll have a meditation, so take one from the audience. Yes. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who has asked a question? Uh, no? I can see Snigda raising her hand, <laughs> physically raising her hand. Uh, so you might want to unmute yourself and ask the question. You're lucky I saw you. Yeah, I just unmuted for me. Okay. All right, uh, go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Kirti. Uh, I'm just really happy to be talking to you. I, I, I've seen some videos of yours before. And um, my question is like, when I'm trying to meditate, I think it's going to be helpful for like, uh, I try to practice like mindfulness, etc. And when I'm focusing on one thing, I cannot focus on the other one. So if I'm trying to plan something for the future, and if I'm in the present, it's not actually helping me. So how do I overcome that? Like little tips and such for beginners might be great. All right. If you are concentrating on one thing, you cannot concentrate on other things. And that's really good. If you are concentrating on one thing and you start thinking of other things, then you're not concentrating on anything. So the, the trick is to concentrate, take up one thing, deal with it with your entire attention, and then let it go and take up the next thing. Normally what we do is we multitask. We divide our attention. It's natural, especially in today's busy age, we multitask. Unfortunately, kids from the um, childhood onwards, they are exposed to a range of devices. And so the kids' attention is divided into many things. That becomes a habit. So that's not good for concentration. A better strategy is that you take up one thing at a time, uh, finish it to your satisfaction, and then move on to the next thing. You will see, it may seem like a time-taking process, but it is actually more effective. Even cognitive scientists, um, psychologists say it's much better to focus on one thing at a time rather than to multitask. So being in the present, very good. You need to plan your future, of course. Put up a schedule. Put up a whiteboard, write down things about you have to do, and then let it go. And then follow it up, take it up one by one. What we normally do is, I'm trying to be in the present. And many things are coming. I have to finish the assignment. I have to go for groceries. I have to meet the faculty advisors. And no, 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 be in the present. Don't do that. Schedule it out as far as possible. Then whatever comes in the schedule, keep your mind on that. One thing to another thing to another thing. That's a good way of doing it. We can take one more question, actually. Yeah, I'll unmute Dimitra. Who is the next person? Uh, hi, Dimitra. Uh, my, Go ahead. hi, my name is Dimitri. Um, I'm new to Vedanta and I wanted to see if I understand uh, this talk correctly. So if I am the existence, consciousness, bliss, which is yeah. complete, immortal, uh, unchanging, who is it that attains liberation? Right. So this is a good question. Who is it that is who wants liberation? Who is the one who is in trouble? Who is the one who is trying to uh, uh, discover the real self? 
So this is what is called the jiva. It's a compound of the real self and a host of appearances. In an Advaitic perspective, um, you, the real self, for whatever reason, we must note that if Advaita is true, then I am this immortal witness consciousness, if it is true. And then we must also note, then it's a fact that I don't know it. It's also a fact right now. If I am that and I do not, right now if I look at it, I don't know it. If you know it, well and good, you don't need the class. But if I don't know it, it I mean, to the level of uh, realization, and to the level of it being an absolutely living reality, I don't know it yet. Then I must also admit that there is some kind of ignorance, some kind of veiling of my real nature. So this veiled real nature in alliance with things which appear to it, like a mind and a body, this is what is called jiva. Jiva means an individual sentient being. Uh, so this is what we are right now. Advaita Vedanta says this is what we seem to be right now. This is the one which engages in the world, which has many pursuits, uh, which, which also transmigrates from lifetime to lifetime. And the goal is to realize that you are not the jiva, but you are Brahman or uh, the, the living reality Atman, the, the in, infinite reality Atman. Does that make sense to you? Notice, notice, sorry, notice the two paradigms. I'll carry on this with you just for a couple of minutes more. Notice the two paradigms, for example, what Swami Atma Rupanji presented and what I presented here. The same logic applies to both. But in the Yoga Sankhya paradigm, which he presented, this infinite consciousness is mixed up with the material nature. And the mixing up, to, to make it very precise, the mixing up does not happen in the infinite consciousness. It happens in the mind. The mind is mixed up, that it thinks that, so mind is the thinking faculty. So the infinite consciousness shines upon the mind, and in the mind the thought is, I am the mind. And with that, the body. And so this is the our present condition. And what Sankhya or Yoga does is to separate the infinite consciousness from the mind, in our understanding, in our realization. And that understanding realization also is in the mind. So that's why the ancient saying that bondage and liberation are both in the mind not in, in, the, in your real nature. There's no bondage or liberation in the real nature. See how it tallies with uh, your question that you asked, who is it that is looking for liberation? It's a, it's a strange compound of the material nature, mind, and uh, pure consciousness in the Sankhya Yoga paradigm. In the Advaita paradigm, which will develop slowly in the other classes, it is not even a separate material nature. It is that pure consciousness alone in which it projects a mind, body, and universe. And then not knowing itself regards itself as one of those little projections. It's like getting lost in a virtual universe, forgetting that you are playing that game and you identify yourself with one of the characters in the game. Or like watching a movie. This is a good example. I'll end with this. Suppose you're watching a movie um, and it's very nicely done. You are in a darkened hall. You can't see yourself, but you can see the big screen and the movie and there's overwhelming sound. So sound and light are there. Pictures are there. You're absorbed in it. And it's a thrilling story. Maybe scary, maybe tragic, maybe funny. You're totally absorbed in it. Now imagine technology goes a little further. Not only you see and hear, but you can smell and taste and touch whatever is happening in the movie. So it's like a super virtual reality. Now you're totally unable to, your sense contacts are no longer with the cinema theater. They are in the virtual reality. A little bit of technology is progressing that way to give you that kind of very immersive experience. All the five senses are involved in the movie. No longer with the world outside. Imagine how immersive that would be. Now go even one step further. Not only the five senses, thoughts. Your thoughts are the hero's thoughts. Your desires and fears and memories are the hero's um, desires, fears, and memories. And you've totally lost touch with your own identity as Dimitri. Imagine what an experience would be like. That's where we are at. That's what Advaita Vedanta says. <laughs> okay. Now let's do a little meditative exercise. Sit straight wherever you are. Take a breath, breathe, uh, breathe in and breathe out, relax. Relax. Don't be rigid. 
breathing in and breathing out, listening to my voice. If you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. Notice your breath. First, at the level of the stomach, maybe as it breathe in, the stomach expands. You breathe out, the stomach contracts. Gently make your attention more subtle, the breath at the nose. Try to feel the air slowly entering the nose, leaving the nose, breathing in at the nose, sensation of breathing out at the nose. Now direct your attention inwards to the mind where there are thoughts, you are hearing my voice, or maybe there are no thoughts, they're just gaps of thoughts. Notice that each thought, each feeling, every sound you hear, every breath you take in or release is experienced and feel, I am the experiencer of these thoughts. Good thought, bad thought, they shine in me, arise in me, shine in me, disappear in me. Sensations in the body, in the breath, whatever sensation there is, notice. They arise in me, the awareness. They shine in me, the awareness. They disappear in me, the awareness. I am not the sensations. I am not the thoughts. I am their witness. I am ever the witness of the mind. If there are thoughts in the mind, I am the one who experiences these thoughts. If there are no thoughts in the mind, I am the one who experiences the absence of thoughts. I am aware of the sensations. They are not aware of me. I am aware of the thoughts and feelings and emotions and ideas. They are not aware of me. I am awareness. I am consciousness. Every thought reveals to me I am consciousness. Every sensation reveals to me I am consciousness. If the mind gets distracted, notice the distraction was noticed by me, the consciousness. Even the distraction reveals to me, I am consciousness. Sitting, relaxed, Breathing normally. Whatever comes to attention, do not bother about it. Just notice that you are noticing it. It is coming to your attention. You are consciousness. All 
all the thoughts and feelings, whatever it is, notice one, they are different from me. Two, they keep changing. I do not. Three, they are many. I am one. Let thoughts come and go. Let sounds come and go. Nothing can disturb you for whatever is disturbing. It is just pointing out you are the witness of that disturbance. You need not resist anything. Any sensation, no matter how unpleasant or pleasant, just use it to become aware that I am the witness of that sensation. Any thought, no matter how nice or how bad, just become aware that I am witnessing that thought. Ever the witness, never the witnessed. Ever the subject, never the object. Ever at rest, never restless. Ever luminous, never the illuminated. I rest in my glory as the one light of consciousness. Breathing in, breathing out. Relaxed. When you feel comfortable, gently open your eyes. Gently open your eyes. Be aware of the room of the device in front of you. The virtual presence of so many people. A couple of interesting things to note, you know. One is, in this kind of meditation, this is a Vedantic Nididhyasana. I just took it from a text called Drig Drishya Vivek, which speaks of six different kinds of Vedantic Nididhyasana. This is the first one, a Vedantic meditation. Notice, in this kind of meditation, there's no chance of distraction. Whatever is disturbing, you can use it. And I am the witness of this disturb disturbance. You will bless the disturbances. A sharp pain, for example, which would be like, totally disastrous for any other kind of meditation is just sharply and blazingly pointing out you, the consciousness. 
does anybody under, you understand what i'm trying to say any kind of sensation sound or disturbance a disturbing sound um, or a classic enemy of a meditator a buzzing mosquito and the, that is continuously pointing to me the awareness which i am every moment every unpleasant sensation i am the witness awareness so there's no possibility of distraction in this kind of meditation every distraction is a help yatra yatra mano yati tatra tatra samadhi so they say wherever the mind goes mind goes means whatever the mind thinks of whatever comes into the mind good or bad pleasant unpleasant indifferent there you will find samadhi <laughs> because you are using it you know how you use it you use it as a mirror in a mirror when you hold a mirror to your face there is a mirror and your face gets reflected there and the reflection of the face immediately points to you reminds you here is your real face which you cannot see there is no objection there is no object there which you can see the real face never becomes an object what you see is in the in the mirror is a reflection of your face and the reflection points back to your real face similarly every thought every sensation that comes to you is a mirror what do you notice there consciousness the thought sensation all are consciousness there is consciousness there and that consciousness should point back to you as the the source of that consciousness i am the original awareness i am the witness consciousness every experience in the world points to your real nature it's an open secret it's right there it's it's just shining all the time you can find peace you can elevate out uh, yourself above the turmoil of the world in an instant try it it should work 